Good evening. Welcome to the East Hampton City Council meeting for Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. The meeting tonight is being recorded and broadcast live via East Hampton Media on Charter Channel 193 and live streamed on East Hampton Media's YouTube channel. As always, we thank Executive Director Jen Ramsey, Tim Riley, and Ryan Arnold for their great commitment in enabling civil engagement. All counselors and participants in this meeting are gathered remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic under an executive order by Governor Baker on March 12th, 2020, allowing us to do so. I won't be able to say that too many more times. Um, I remind both of the mem both members of the city council and of the public to remain on mute until recognized by the chair. Also for members of the public, please remove your camera for the duration of the meeting unless you are participating in public speak. Thank you. The meeting is now called to order. Barbara, can we have the roll call? Peg Conniff. Here. Salem Derby. Present. Erica Flood. He's here. 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 Omar Gomez. JP Kaczynski. Tom Peak. Here. Dan Rist. Here. Lindsay Rothschild. She's here. Yep. Here. And Owen Zara. Present. Thank you. Uh, we will now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Girl. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 5th? So moved. Second. Motion is second to approve the minutes of May 5th. Any further conversation? Barbara. Peg Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Omar uh, Tom Peak. Aye. Dan Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zara. Yes. Okay. Uh, we will now move into public speak. Uh, for those of you who would like to participate in public speak on any topic other than what's in the public's hearings, except if you want to say something about um, the reminder, go ahead and say it now. We are going to have kind of a pseudo public hearing. And if you don't want to talk then, you can talk now. Either one for that one. Um, remember that the city council may only listen to your comments and we cannot respond. We ask that you remain respectful and direct your comments only to the city council. If you would like to speak, please, raise, please select raise your hand under the reactions option. Please remain on mute and keep your camera turned off until called. Before commenting, please state your name for the record and address and your address or precinct that you're in. You will have three minutes to make your comments. Tonight, we do have a public hearing at 6.15, so public speak will be paused if we need to, and then restarted when the public hearings are over. All right, anyone who would like to speak? I see Myra. Myra, go ahead. Um, good evening, counselors. I'm here reading a letter um, from the group of Me Is Not Enough. I'll be reading the first portion of this open letter to City Council. Dear City Council members, we as members of a kind are here to read a letter that explores our experiences being a grassroots community group here in East Hampton. We are here to highlight how the way, how the way current city government functions leads to the stifling of community voices and how these actions and practices of city council members and members of municipal structures censure and erase activist voices in the community. Ania is Not Enough was established during the pandemic with limited opportunity for face-to-face -face communication. Through usage of digital media and social media, we have made efforts to build and engage the community through ongoing educational events, while also creating space and avenues for community dialogue where few opportunities existed. As counselors, you have been given, you have been extended personal invitations to this event and community di and dialogue. Given these limitations brought on by the pandemic, in order to invite 
members of the community to specific events and engage in community dialogue, we have relied on East Hampton community forums on social media to make our neighbors aware of these events. However, recently we have noticed that a counselor using power as a moderator on one of these forums has worked to silence members' voices, members, and deny our voice. While understanding that these social media forums are not governmental commun communication, when counselors act as moderators of East Hampton community forums, there exists a type of double jeopardy as there is an assertion of power and influence within the council and as a and the con and the consequence of manufacturing and distorting community dialogues through bias whether intentional or unconscious having the power to sculpt community dialogue through approval and rejection of posts made by members and the authority to delete or turn off comments is a slippery slope that can result in manipulation and conformity bias within the community with the effect of silencing some voices and amplifying others that enable and a bit, excuse me, chosen causes and campaigns. Thank you. Peg, you're muted. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm from sorry. Precinct Let's too. Okay, thanks, Myra. I'm sorry, I thought I was off mute. Liz, you're up next. I meant one. Hi, my name is Liz. I live in uh, Ward 3. I'm going to continue with this letter. While we do not dis want to discourage counselors from participating in social media platforms, we would, like to, we would like to make members of this council aware of the potential for bias and influence when acting in the capacity of a moderator. We would ask that the members of the council that are moderators of East, East Hampton Community Forums to terminate the role as moderator of such pages. We further ask this council to examine this issue and develop rules and policies surrounding social media, which include disallowing sitting, counseling, sitting council members to moderate East Hampton-based social media community forums. Since ACINE's formation, city, city, uh, city leadership and city council have shown a pattern which undermines and silences our voices. On multiple occasions, our BIPOC leadership have been invited to city tables to be part of discussion, only then to be disregarded by city leadership. At the same time, councillors have shown support and accepted our advice in private, but then in the public eye, especially regarding policies, this allyship disappears. Let's first remember the CRC election process in which the only two women of color who are volunteering their time to serve on this committee were scrutinized over minor details of their lives while their high professional qualifications seemed to go unnoticed. We watched as male members of the city council blatantly disregard the threat of sexual violence the women had faced in regards to their activism. At the same time, white women were hardly questioned about their candidacy for the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Shelby and Donovan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Shelby and Donovan Lee, uh, we live in East Hampton, Precinct 4, and we're going to continue with this letter. Uh, we see the biases in the mayor's pledge report where in a survey completed by East Hampton police officers, several officers react with deep biases and hatred towards Akin. Here are a couple of examples of their statements, sentiments. I disagree with everything that Akin is about. Their mission is not to make East Hampton better. In my opinion, it's that they formed in an attempt to abolish the entire law enforcement function in East Hampton. Another example is the few people that don't know East Hampton police officers who base their opinions based on the few bad decisions made by officers they see on the national news creates a tough work environment and unfairly demonizes us when we have done nothing wrong. You now have local radical groups such as Akine, which have some of their members on the CRC who have strong biases against the East Hampton Police Department solely because they hate police officers. 
How are we supposed to feel safe in our community knowing that the police officers in town hold such views about us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Quincy L. Um, hi, my name is Quincy LaCrosse and I live in Precinct 1 and I'll be continuing the letter. Um, a kind has encouraged participation in the ongoing public safety committee meetings. We have organized to educate our members on how to show up to public hearings and we come prepared to engage. In the first hearing, against the clearly stated meeting rules, records access officer Sergeant Chad Alexander called out by name all eight kind of members who had spoken previously. He aggressively dismissed their concerns and questioned their legitimacy as constituents and residents of the town. He was not, to our knowledge, reprimanded in any way for those actions. As an officer, if he is that emboldened to act with such aggression towards the community in front of his boss, what can we assume about how he acts when he is not in his boss's presence? How can members of a kind feel safe after that in incident? Twice in, in the second public safety listening session, our members were shut down. One was never called on, while other members of the public, including police and their supporters, were allowed to speak up out of turn, and some spoke multiple times. In that same public safety meeting, when an individual raised concerns about police and intimidation they'd encountered, Chief Alberti inserted himself, dismissed the experience, and stated that intimidation is a serious charge and that the person should report it to the police or the CRC. Not only was this response inappropriate, it did not provide a real solution to the issue. If an indi individual already does not feel safe with the police, how is forcing them to report police misconduct to the police appropriate? How is suggesting reporting the incident to the CRC, a committee that still has no structure or power, a path towards a solution? It is time for counselors to take stands for what is right and to support and represent the residents of East Hampton that voted you into office. Just in the last week, our initiative to host an Akine sponsored Budget 101 event with a member of the City Council was co opted and taken out of our hands after we had worked to set structure and agreements about the event. Again, undermining the work that goes into organizing in our community and giving more residents an understanding of local governance and ultimately a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Julie. Hi, my name is Julie and I live in Precinct um, 1. And first I want to say to the counselors, I appreciate everything that you guys do. I know that you guys are really trying your best. Um, I have the opportunity, um, two things. I had the opportunity to join the 101 budget meeting that was held this past week. And it was held very professional. It was held very direct in focus. Um, and there was no reason for anybody to really worry about that. Um, Omar Gomez did an excellent job and he educated us on the process. He stuck to his agenda, which was perfect. Um, also, I'd like to say that I've been attending the CRC meetings that have been going online as well. Again, this is something new to me. And I have to say that my disappointment in the attacks against the police were quite vivid. And I did not see absolutely anybody insulting Aiken or anybody in their groups. They did not dismiss them. But when people throw out an accusation, you can't expect an immediate response. The response is, the proper response is we need to look into it, report it. As far as the other officers speaking, there was no disrespect in what they were saying and they were being attacked by other people. So I just hope that everybody can work together and realize that everybody is part of the community, whether they're a police officer and they live in our community or they're adjacent to another town and work in our police department. We need to come together as a whole, and I hope that can happen without tearing down each other, but building each other up. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Sierra. Hello. Hello. Got a little echo going on there. <laughs> Hello. Hello. 
If you're logged into two computers, that might be the problem. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Sierra, and I live in Precinct 1, and I will be continuing the letter. Akine has still never been publicly recognized for bringing school lunch delivery and internet access to the city's attention. We mobilized first to raise $500 in emergency food support and then managed to deliver just over 9,000 meals to children in East Hampton, which meant coordinating complicated door-to-door -door food deliveries three days a week from mid-January to April 1st, using all volunteer support and vehicles. To be clear, we didn't do this work for recognition, but to watch our contributions erased while the city attempts to take ownership and public credit for our work is part of the pattern of the city's relationship to us and does not foster trust with us or other members of the community. Akine is here to hold city officials accountable for their words and actions, but we are also working to model new ways of being a community with each other. Care and respect for all of our neighbors guides our standards and we intentionally uplift the voices of people of color because there is no other platform within the city to do so. These issues we have mentioned on their own could be swallowed and considered isolated incidents, but the pattern of dismissal and silencing by our city representatives doesn't only negatively impact Akine, it is a setting a precedent to open the door to types of actions that both Akine and the stated goals in the mayor's pledge seeks to prevent. And that is violence and intimidation from the police department towards residents of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn. Are, is it public the Carolyn. Public hearing time? No, nope. it, well, it, 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 there's two more people, so I'll let you go ahead. There's two more people. OK, um, just uh, I just want to say, you know, I was at the public safety hearing, so I'm picking up on some of these themes. and. Um, you know, but Akine is going, trying to educate ourselves, we prepare ourselves and um, showing up to raise questions. And, you know, at that meeting, the term disproportionality was questioned. Like we couldn't use anyone or in the report, disproportionality, which is not identifying systemic things, you know, so we couldn't use that uh, as a door opener to look at where we need to be paying attention, where we need to find things. So that was that kind of challenge coming you know, toward the report. And then also the idea, like raising the question of it to intimidate, like to intimidate police, police officers appearing um, and doing things. You know, just, you know, folks having a gun is intimidating, not, you know, so some awareness of that role could be helpful. So uh, that is what I am saying tonight as part of this effort. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Natalie. Thank you. Um, my name is Natalie Gomez, Precinct 2. On May 5th, 2021, Officer Robert Fusca showed up at my house asking for a Carmen Vega. Allegedly, there was a landline call from 911 from my home that required his assistance, which is unheard of considering there has never been a Carmen living in this apartment. As I returned home from work about 10 minutes later, my son proceeded to tell me that there was an officer here asking about a 69 Parsons Street and if there was a Carmen Vega who lived at this address. Yet, when I looked into the public police log, there was no sign of him being here. There is nothing indicating he was here or that he even patrolled here. Luckily, there are many cameras in my community that showed him pulling in and out of Parsons Village that evening that coincided with my son's story. The fact that this particular entry is missing from the public log is absolutely alarming. This is a specific example of many incidents that have been read during this public speak of East Hampton Police Department not being held accountable for their behavior. With the lack of accountability from city councils, the mayor, or anyone with any actual power, this will only continue to happen. What kind of trust can you expect from residents of this community to have in the city when you cannot even control your own police department? Rather than holding them accountable for their actions, you have allowed them to act like this and bully whoever they want without consequence. The mayor, 
city councilors, and others are too afraid to stand up to these officers, which is why they never want to align themselves with ACAIN, because they do know what happens when people disagree with the police department. However, however, the city council, Mayor La Chapelle, were elected to represent our community, not the police. You were elected to make sure this community is safe for everyone. Therefore, we would like the city council and Mayor La Chapelle to hold our police accountable and look into these missing police logs. Akin is not afraid to stand up for what's right, and our numbers are only growing and becoming stronger. We hope that the city council and mayor's office is also not afraid to do what's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I uh, don't see anybody else for public speak, so I will take a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Motion a second to open the public hearing. Any further discussion? Barb. Uh, Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Uh, Tom Peak. Aye. Dan Rust. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zarrett. Yes. Ed Conniff. Aye. All right, the public hearing is now open. First thing we have on the agenda is a supplemental appropriation. Councilor Rist. I'm sorry, I thought Mr. Smith was first. Um, I have to change my view. We have on our, uh, on our agenda this evening a $100,000 appropriation. The appropriation is a request from the mayor to improve, I'm sorry, to supplement the appropriation for legal services. The Finance Committee approved this th three to zero. This appropriation is necessary because we have a great deal of legal uh, requirements coming up, which we need to get done uh, by uh, July 1st. A lot of them are um, legal easement reviews, especially for uh, the Union Street um, renovation that we're moving forward. We also have some labor negotiations, reviews, and we have easements in the one in the Ferry Street area. We have a great deal of legal review. I think it was something like 27 were necessary for uh, um, the easements on Union. And uh, if you have any questions, the mayor can answer them for you, but uh, it is absolutely necessary because we have a lot of legal uh, needs uh, for the community. So, as I said, the Finance Committee approved this uh, three to zero. Mayor, do you have any comments? Uh, Councilor Rist uh, summarized quite well um, the $100,000 that we're requesting um, is largely pushed by uh, the easements we have to do with the different development. Uh, projects, but also a couple of our other grants and policies, our RFPs require legal review. Uh, and this is just piling up at the end of the year. If of the 27 easements for Union Street, uh, the property is donated, then we will not have a legal expense and the money will sweep back into um, cannabis. Okay. Oh, that's true. I forgot to say that unlike other um, appropriations, if this funds are not used, it goes back into stabilization. It does not become free cash. Important thing to note, unlike other appropriations we make. Do any counselors have any questions? Counselor Zarek. Is there a general breakdown of how much we're expecting uh, in terms of legal fees for all these different these categories here? We didn't receive those, but I'm sure the mayor can supply that if necessary. One, um, yes, I can once I spend it. <laughs> yes, we don't get billed until after they do the work. Yeah, these projects are ongoing, and I requested so much money because of just uh, the city council schedule. Um, and making sure the Union Street easements and title searches concern me the most. We're in a very tight timeline that we don't get to set. Um, and that for from the state and MassDOT. So we've already started the process. And if 
we're hoping that we can finish it up by June 30th. It actually would be a delay in the project if we couldn't. So I, I asked um, not for retro expenses, but this is um, forward expenses. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone from the public who has anything, any questions around this appropriation? One of the dogs might have to say. I know. Sorry. <laughs> um, if there's nothing else, then uh, Council Rist. I make a motion that the full council approve a supplemental appropriation. The appropriation is for one hundred thousand dollars to be transferred from cannabis stabilization, one hundred thousand dollars to be transferred to the legal professional services account, one hundred thousand dollars for the following purpose, to cover the deficit for legal expenses that increased due to staff needs during the pandemic, including police CBA negotiations, policy review resulting from mayor's pledge recommendations, Union Street easement reviews, and monthly flat fees. I need a second. 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 Mo motion is second to approve the uh, appropriation of $100,000 from cannabis stabilization to legal professional services. Any further discussion? Barbara. Erica Flood. Aye. Tom Peake. Aye. Dan Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zarrett. Yes. Peg Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, next up on the public hearing, it's it's uh, it's a little different in that there's nothing for us to vote on here, um, but the mayor had asked and Fran Smith from the reminder had asked if um, he could come before this council and before the public and answer any questions we may have and to kind of present um, thoughts and ideas around how we can have the reminder delivered to homes in East Hampton, as you are all aware. Uh, we have an ordinance that restricts this kind of uh, delivery, and we have started to enforce that. And Fran uh, had some ideas, so he asked if he could come here. I said, sure. So we put it in the uh, public hearing section so that the public could ask questions and that uh, you all could ask questions as well. So I'll turn it over to Fran. Fran, go ahead if you would like to make your commentary. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. So we started the uh, East Hampton Reminder newspaper. East Hampton deserves its own newspaper. And we started it like last July. Uh, we delivered for eight months without any incidents or problems. We did have opt-outs. We did have people call us and ask us not to deliver. We honored those requests. There are 251 homes that have opted out since that start date. Um, to my knowledge, we messed up one of them and we delivered it a couple of times and we corrected that. Uh, I got personally involved in that one. Um, we, uh, what happened when the snow came and some newspapers got, uh, you know, lost under the snow, when the snow melted, the town looked messy. We sent out several drivers to clean up the areas and pick up whatever was left around town. And I think we did a great job of that based on my driving around through the town. Um, and we're requesting the council to allow us to deliver the way we need to deliver to stay in business. And I think it's good for the town. I think our newspaper has been beneficial for the city. Um, and we're asking for a moratorium on citations of, of, of enforcing the ordinance against us. This week's newspaper, for example, has it's delivered today and tomorrow have stories about cannabis delivery story, it's got advertising from uh, New River Valley Co-op and Big E's. It's got uh, work on Mountain View School uh, Roundabout uh, done by Ryan, who, who is probably doing a story about what I'm speaking about right now. Actually, he's on the call. Um, and uh, East Hampton residents receiving President's Awards from Florence Bank, events from the Chamber, Council on Aging, uh, Emily Williston um, uh, Library, photos of Hampshire regional ball players. There's a lot of important news and I think it's good for the town. And I don't think uh, we're hoping that that an ordinance that stops something that's good for the town would maybe give us a chance to prove that we can do it right. And we our opt out list, and we hang our hat on that. I hang my hat on that. I've been doing that since 1978. And um, that's the key to us doing it right. Now I sent yesterday, I sent the mayor and Peg 
a new front page mock-up, um, basically putting the uh, opt-out contact information directly under the name of our newspaper on the front page above the fold so people can easily find out how to stop our paper, stop the paper if they don't want it. Um, and hopefully we'll start running that next week on the front page every week. So hopefully that will uh, alleviate any other problems that we have. Okay, are there any counselors who have any questions or comments to direct at Fran about this? Counselor Zare. Uh, thank you, President Conniff. Uh, one question that might be the simplest way of solving this, Mr. Smith, is uh, has there been any conversation about uh, newspaper uh, dispensary kiosks, much like we've seen in the past with like the Advocate newspaper, which is also, which is free, um, strategically placing them through the city so that people who are interested in the paper can uh, access it? Um, and then a opt-in only for residents who want it delivered to their house instead of having to opt out. Um, just a general commentary too on some of the reporting. Um, I can speak to from experience that um, there's very little contact from the reporters um, in terms of stories that, I, that it, I've been involved with. Um, and I don't know if this is my colleague's experience as well, but. Oftentimes the reporting is basically just a transcript of the meeting. And I don't know if that's really adding much news for our residents uh, who can just get a copy of uh, the minutes and, and watch the city council meeting. So I would just ask that maybe um, uh, the, your reporters try to um, up the quality a little bit in that regard and actually go to the source. Um, that's all. Thank you. Sure, let me address that last, the last comment <clears throat> first. Uh, Ryan uh, Fair is on the call now. He's our lead reporter for East Hampton. Uh, Chris Maz is our editor. Uh, I will make sure that your comment is heard. I, I think Ryan's on the call now, but I'll make sure your comments are heard by both of them. But I also invite you and all of your uh, fellow councilmen to send a letter to our newspaper anytime you want. We'll be happy to print it. Um, about any item or any issue you have. We, letters to the editor are welcome and, and we encourage them and we encourage interaction with you and we'd love to have that. As far as the delivery goes, um, the opt-in model won't, will allow us to go out of business. It won't allow us to continue our newspaper. Here's why. We are the non-subscriber newspaper for the Republican as well. So but Stop and Shop, Big Y, uh, now River Valley Co-op, um, they, they want their flyers delivered to every home. And in order for us to stay in business, we need to have that business to do that. If we lose, if we lose the delivery to, you know, pretty much not every home, but pretty much every home, we would lose those flyers. They would probably mail them and therefore we would lose that revenue and probably go out of business. So uh, it's, it's a model that's not sustainable for us, which is why we're pushing so hard to do it the right way here. Uh Thank you, Frank. Councillor Flood, Councillor Rothschild, if you could raise your hand using the thing, then you can queue up because I can't, I'm looking at the, the, the area where we have everybody's hand raised and Councillor Flood was next. Go ahead, Councillor Flood. Thank you. Um, Fran, I just want you to know I am a proponent of local news and I think newspapers are incredibly important. I think this is a very difficult situa situation we're in. I understand that there's a business model you're trying to uphold, but I also understand that some of the challenges of what you're proposing, for instance, having an opt-out printed on the front page means somebody would actually have to physically pick that up, take it out of the blue bag, which they're not doing, and read the front page. So there's problem number one. When these blue bags are laying everywhere, they're laying there because people are not picking them up. Um, so I, I would suggest perhaps exploring the idea of a mailing to every household, a postcard with an opt-in to see what those numbers would look like. And I also hear your concern about not having enough readership but if it's still a free newspaper and you make it very clear that it's a free opt-in, I think there's a number of people who would take advantage of opting in. And I don't think you would miss as many people. And also, I just have to go back to when I was younger and the Gazette used to be delivered and it would, 
you know, we're in New City and a lot of us have front porches and the paper made it actually onto the front porch. Now, again, we had to pay a newspaper person to bring it to the front porch, but it was something my elderly relatives, you know, waited for the paper to come in the morning and said, good morning. You know, they were early risers, but I do think that you might find success with people being able to opt in to what is a really uh, great free local service. And you're giving them the option to participate rather than kind of shoving it in their face is what it feels like and for a lack of a more eloquent way to say it. Uh, I think I there's a lot of potential in what you're doing and the local coverage is incredibly important. And I would also love to see it expanded to student journalism in the high school and the middle school. So I don't want to see the reminder go away. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, I think unfortunately this fine or fortunately is bringing this conversation, you know, more importantly to a head right here so that we can creatively find a solution. But I would very much encourage you to try something like a mailing, just letting people know this is free. We're here for you and giving them the opportunity to make that decision for themselves and find the value in what you're doing. I'm a big um, fan of what you're doing. And I think the model just needs to be tweaked a little bit more, but I'd hate to see the reminder go away. And I want to thank you for giving it a shot. There are newspapers shutting down all over this country and the loss of local news is really the beginning of the end of democracy. And I'm not sure how many people really understand that concept, but for me, that's number one. So thank you for your efforts. And I'd be happy to sit down with you and talk some more outside of meeting to see if we can find some solutions. Thank you. I really appreciate that you like our newspaper. Um, I also agree that local news is really important. That's why I've spent my whole life doing it. Uh, I've been in newspaper business since 1978. I've worked at 14 newspapers in four states and three countries. Um, the the opt in model won't work for us because if we lost even 20% of the homes, we would be out of business because we'd lose the pre-print advertising. So it's just a financial thing. It's just a revenue versus cost. We don't charge subscriptions. Therefore we deliver as, as inexpensively as possible, which is why driveway delivery is what works for us. If we, to go, we were to go to porch delivery, it would double our distribution costs and we would again be upside down on our money. We, we wouldn't be making money, therefore we wouldn't be here. So we're trying to have a model where we do have good community newspaper with good community news and, and be nice to people, be good citizens and honor all opt-outs. Um, the other thing we do, it's not just the people that won't pick up the bag. So we, we've trained our carriers that if they see a bag that hasn't been picked up from last week, pick it up and leave another one because that person might be on vacation. If they see it the second week in a row, pick the bag up and stop the address. Don't deliver there anymore. So we do have a system in place where if somebody doesn't even open the bag, we won't let papers pile up. Um, unfortunately, when the snow covered the papers, we couldn't see them. And during that time, we had a problem. But from July 1st of last year until until February, we, we we had no problem with that at all. And I expect that to go forward now. Do we have a problem when the snow melts next year? Yes, but I'll send a team out there <laughs> to work on it. Uh, Councilor Rothschild. Um, I guess I think we've lost some public trust in terms of the delivery of this paper. Um, I, I got more complaints from residents asking me about why this was be de delivered, especially when we're trying to, at the same time, put in ordinances that are conservation focused. Um, I hear you saying that they were gathered up because of the snow, but when I was um, FaceTiming with my mother, when she was checking in my house in March, there were three piled up behind her on my stoop that I could see. Um, we have this ordinance for a reason. It's because people in our town don't like things thrown on their driveway. And I'm sorry if that means like, it's not, a, you know, it's not your business can't go forward. But unfortunately, I believe that's the will of the people in this town. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor uh, Rist. You probably were going to say that this is going to cost too much, but 
I don't, I don't feel you should wait a week to check to see if bags are picked up. I think you should wait two days, and if you send out delivery people to look for bags still on driveways, you pick them up. The complaints are they're here. I drive around. We know we normally get the paper through because we have the Republican delivered in my house. But I drove. I think you deliver on Thursdays. If that's the case, Wednesday, 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 both days, yeah. Thursdays. Wednesday and Thursday. All right. So. Oh, it's hard to tell. I drive around on Saturday and I see them on the on driveways because people aren't home or they don't pick them up. That's the complaint. So you may survive, it may cost more, but you may survive if you get rid of those bags that are on, if they're not, if they're not picked up, they're not doing you any good with regard to flyers anyway. So wait, wait a couple of days. Don't wait two or three weeks. That's not going to work. My suggestion is send guys out, look for bags that are still on the ground two days later and get them up. I love the paper. When I didn't get, I got chickpeas for a couple of times. I was upset about that because we're not chickpea and I called. But then I went over to Big Y and got one because I think it does a good job of telling stories. Although I agree with Owen, we we could have a little more in depth of council meetings. But on the other hand, I, I was very pleased, and Councilor Gomez will will be pleased with this. We had a great spread on the softball team the other day. Um, I think that's great. But I agree with Councilor Rothschild. Uh, we have an ordinance, so waiting a couple of weeks to pick up blue bags that are still there is why these complaints come to us. So you may have to go out there after a couple days and pick them up. And I think if you do that, the complaints will stop. It's possible we can People do don't have the, you know, I, uh, I call the Gazette and tell them I don't want it if I'm on vacation for a week. So I don't know what to say. I think that's the best way you can do it. Get them off the driveways after a couple days. Councilor Zaret. Thank you. Uh, and just to clarify, Mr. Smith and the, the other representatives who are gathered here from the paper, I do appreciate you recovering local news. My, my comment before was that I'm often surprised to see stories where myself or my colleagues uh, have done a lot of work and there wasn't the due diligence to talk to them about uh, the, the items they put forward. This isn't about letters to the editor or anything like that. Um, but I have a second question because this is something that's gonna be coming up soon. And I think that someone spoke to this once before, but I just wanted clarification. Are the bags that the papers are in, are they ASTM certified compostable? Great, yes, yes. Okay. Better than compostable, we studied it carefully. Thank you. Anyone and we, else? Spend, uh, we spend more on those bags than we had in the past. So that's what well, we're happy to do it. We wanna make sure that we're doing the right thing for there. Anyone else from the council? Who has any questions? Anyone from the public? Okay. Um, my only comment to, oh, I'm sorry, Myra, go ahead. Sorry, um, lower hand. I just wanted to speak um, to my own personal like for the newspaper. And I know it's been said there's been complaints, but I think this newspaper provides lots of local coverage, especially for people who don't have the disposable time to watch hours of city council meetings. They can get a quick synopsis um, of what happened and what occurred. And I think it does a service of being able to expand what's happening and make it more more um, more noticeable in the community. So I don't think that it's the will of the people necessarily, even if you've gotten a few complaints, those are probably complaints of convenience um, in that I think rather I find the reminder refreshing. I've come from Springfield and I <laughs> used to enjoy the penny saver, which I think was part of the publication. So um, it provides a lot of great coverage. I think the the coverage of the council meetings is actually extraordinary. People take detailed notes um, where you don't have to watch a three, four hour video when you don't have disposable time. So I thank you for the publication. Um, I rather enjoy it and I don't want it to see it go away. And similar, we have a lot of um, problems with pollution in East Hampton and residents not being um, 
respectful and good stewards of the environment. People throw bottles around town and it's not a unique, unique situation to see newspapers. So perhaps everyone can be good stewards and pick up newspapers as well as pick up those knit bottles that we're talking about. All right, thank you. Thanks, Myra. Uh, Shelby and Donovan. Hi, uh, I just wanted to jump in uh, and say that I also agree uh, with Myra's sentiments on the local paper and the importance, especially uh, the fact that they do cover the city council meetings is definitely uh, beneficial and I think a good service. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the community members do uh, benefit from the paper. That's all, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Councilor Rostow. Where are the directions how to opt out if people want to opt out? It's currently? not there yet, I don't think. Uh, they're on, it's on page six this week, but it'll be on the front page from now on starting next week. It'll be, as soon as you see the East Hampton reminder directly below it, you'll see you'll see the directions. And it's in a different you know, color. And a phone, email and a phone number, either way. Okay, because I think that was part of the issue. Like I knew people could opt out, but I couldn't see how to do it and it right. seems so like yes it would need to be on the front page and maybe even on the plastic bag for people that it'll be well it'll be on the it'll be on, it'll be on, printing on biodegradable bags is tricky but we will definitely have it on the front page above the fold and uh we want to do the right we want to be good citizens we're in the public relations business we don't want mm -hmm. people we want to inform people and help people we want to be something good for the town so i want to just um kind of level set on this topic uh, for the public and uh, the city council even. So we have an ordinance prohibiting this kind of delivery. We are now enforcing that ordinance over the last several, last, the last month, month and a half. So Fran well knows that he's being cited uh, for a, a fee or a fine uh, every week that he delivers the paper um, outside of the bounds of our ordinance. That said, and I, and I appreciate the feedback, but I myself have gotten, I won't say hundreds, I'll say dozens of emails uh, against this, but I acknowledge that yes, there are people who just uh, want to complain to complain. But um, I do think people could do a little more picking up of things and generally cleaning up instead of keeping things there but it is an ordinance. And so uh, my message to the council is that if there is someone on the council who would like to bring this forward as, a, as an item for discussion, I will leave that up to you to do that to see if we want to change the ordinance. Lindsay, you are in the throes of an ordinance review right now for all of our ordinances. Um, if you deem that this is something you want us to revisit, Certainly we can do that. We cannot unilaterally say we're gonna go back to delivering the paper outside the bounds of the ordinance unless we change the ordinance. So um, Salem, I know you were instrumental in putting this forward. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that there are ways around this or, or how would you like to move forward with this? Well, I mean, I, I think that the, the biggest issue here is that we, if we have ordinances on the books, we shouldn't randomly decide to enforce or not enforce those ordinances. Um, if we don't want to enforce an ordinance, then we need to change the ordinance. Is that's my perspective, and that was that's been my perspective from the beginning. You know, I mean, there was a lot of thought that went into that ordinance in the original. You know, Joy Winnie did put it forward, and I was on the subcommittee, um, and it and it was basically around you know inconvenience for people that they didn't ask for, you know, and, and it was gumming up people's snowblowers. It was littering their lawns. You know, I mean, I've seen probably uh, for some reason on South street on the corner, there's, there becomes, you know, a pile of 10 or more uh, just like next to this wetland area. Um, and, and I, and I, and I, I also, you know, the delivery method is a little bit problematic, which hasn't really been talked about, which is a car driving on both sides of the road slowly um, and with the driver throwing the papers out of, you know, I've, I've witnessed not two people in the car, but one person in the car throwing papers as they drive, which is not, I would say, probably less than safe. 
Um, and that, that part hasn't really been addressed yet, but, um, you know, I, I do think that if we are going to, if we're going to not enforce this, then we have to change the ordinance. That's just my perspective. Okay. Be happy to discuss efforts to work together to possibly change the ordinance to help allow a local community newspaper that's good for the town. Yeah. So, so Fran, what my suggestion would be that unless this body decides to take it up again as a, as a change and, you know, that's entirely up to members of this council if they want to bring forward a change to the ordinance uh, and we can revisit it. Um, but unless and until that happens, we're kind of stuck where we are. And, and I, I just don't, to Councillor Derby's point, if we have an ordinance, we need to enforce it or we need to change it or get rid of it. And unless that new business is brought forward to this body in, in an official way, I don't know how we would proceed beyond where we are right now. So if, if there is no appetite from the council or the public for us to bring forward a change to this ordinance, the ordinance stands as it is. So there would be someone who would like to change it because they appreciate local community news and understand that East, that East Hampton should have its own newspaper. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Councilor Rostra? Yeah, it's just, it's not just the news, even if people appreciate the news and it opens itself up to many other things being thrown on the driveway. And so that that's the concern and that's the reason the ordinance was put there in the first place, so. It doesn't have to be though. There, the first amendment to the constitution doesn't allow advertising to be delivered. It, it allows news to be delivered. And so some ordinances such as the first amendment, um, you know, um, are specific to local community newspapers. We would ask for, you know, we would ask for an ordinance that would allow local community news. As long as we do a good job of, of honoring people, del not delivering to people who don't want it. We, we I, want that. We, I feel like we're getting know. gummed up in the conversation around, do we want local news or not? I think 100% everyone wants local news, 100%. I don't think you would get anyone to say, nope, we don't want it. I, I personally love it. I love the newspaper. I don't love seeing blue bags all over the city. I think the point here that we're trying to make is that we have an ordinance around delivery of things to a driveway. It doesn't matter what is in the blue bag. It's right now, our focus is on, we have an ordinance that does not allow us to throw things onto driveways. We consider that litter and garbage. So again, we have one on the books it would need to change and it would need to change with this body. And I can't certainly tell you, yeah, go ahead and deliver the paper. We'll figure it out later. We have to go by the ordinance. And this, these are the people that, that can change it or not change it. Um, I'm officially asking that you take a look at it as a, as a, as a group and, and hopefully change it to allow our newspaper could, because everybody likes it and that's great. Um, but we can't stay in business without this business model. Okay. So it's, it's, it's one goes with the other, it's hand in hand. So, okay. Uh, Councilor Flood. I'm just to be very clear and say, I have no intention of changing this ordinance and I really find value in your newspaper. And I think that if you do a really good job of continuing to deliver relevant local news, then maybe you're going to find another business model. But what it sounds to me is you need the advertising revenue to give us what we're interested in. I hear you, but it doesn't work for us. So I'm sorry, I won't bring this forward to, to make a change, but I, I really encourage you to find a way to make this work to continue to deliver local news because it's clearly valued and people are paying for subscriptions for other newspapers. Why would they not opt in to something they value if they're given the choice. That's just my question to you. So have confidence in your reporters and up your game and let people choose to support you and see where that leads. It's, I'm just, um, you know, I'm asking that of you. I hear what you're asking of us and I'm asking, I'm swinging that back around to you. I think there's value in it, but we can't just change the rules. It doesn't work that way. 
Any other comments from either the public or council? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Zara, go ahead. Um, just wanted to echo the fact that I think we're missing the point. I think we all appreciate local news. I think that's been stated by both members of the public and this body. I would also just as a point of order, remind everyone that we don't have this as an agenda item. So I'm just wary about open meeting law issues about deliberating over a um, ordinance amendment or repeal thereof. But uh, we like your paper. Um, we just don't want residents who don't want it to have it littering their lawns and their driveway. So that's why the ordinance was written. I'm sure Councilor Derby can comment more and wax poetic about it. Um, and that so this conversation is because of historically, this was an issue in the past. That's why we're having this conversation now. So we're here to support you. If you want all of us through our messaging to make sure that people are aware of the reminder and how to get it, happy to do it. Just uh, respect the residents who don't want it on their lawns. And uh, we're looking forward to more stories from you. Thank you. I actually, shared my, I actually shared my cell phone, personal cell phone number with the mayor and Peg. And I'll share it with you, 413-374-3555. Anyone can call me anytime and ask me to stop delivery and I will stop. Councilor Derby? Looks like someone's calling right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I just want to say, you know, as someone who originally worked on this, uh, you know, we didn't want to, you know, inhibit the news to be able to be delivered. We just wanted to make it more uh, respectful to the residents and, and to the environment. And that being said, you know, what we said in the ordinance was it had to be put on the porch or I believe we even allowed for uh, a exception for like a hook on a mailbox which, you know, to me, that seems like something that could be a really easy fix. It would not be that expensive, and it wouldn't really take that much more time than tossing it out of a window as opposed to hanging it on a hook, which would allow it to be, you know, not all over people's yards. So I just wanted to put that out yeah. there. It's not that we're trying to stop it. It's that we just wanted to not have litter. We would definitely consider doing that to neighborhoods where people were very upset, but to do it in the whole town would double our delivery costs by stopping at every mailbox post to do the hook and hook installation would be about $7,500 for the town. <clears throat> Councilor Risk. You're muted, Dan. I wanted to say that I subscribe to the two newspapers. USA Today is one that's in a blue bag and it's in my driveway, but I subscribe to it. So I solicited that newspaper. The problem isn't whether it's thrown in the driveway. The problem is it's thrown in without the choice of the resident to have it there. So going back to Erica's idea of opting in, if I want your paper, I don't care if you throw it on my driveway because that's where the other papers go. It's whether or not I want it. So I think that's the problem. It's the unwanted papers that are being thrown on people's lawns and driveways when they don't want it. That's the complaints we get. I think the people yes. that like the paper that get it from their driveways and read it aren't the ones that are calling. So I'm just saying that's the practical problem you're gonna have, I guess. I hear you. The newspaper business is not the most profitable business in the world right now, which is why 2,100 newspapers closed last year. Um, the, in order for us to do this right, uh, to lose, to, to have an opt-in only model would allow us to lose all of our preprint business. And please understand that that would put us, it, it would not make it possible for us to deliver. Just a uh, I tr please trust that my my 45 years in the business, I, I do know. I don't know a anything about running a city, but I know a lot about running a newspaper. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Councilor Peak. It kind of feels like we're at an impasse here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think anyone wants the newspaper to go away. The current form of delivery of the newspaper is not allowed under our laws. If we wanted to look at just repealing that and allowing this sort of thing. I would take a fair look at that, but I mean, I just, I, I don't want to get too far into it because of the same concerns that Councillor Zara stated, but like, to me, it feels like if we're going to look at some sort of alternate solution, we are like, somebody's going to have to come up with something because everything that we've suggested tonight, um, Mr. Smith has suggested would, would be in a not, not a viable business model. If the only business model is one that's banned in the city, I don't understand 
what they're like i i don't i don't see how we move forward out of this so, i mean like i just feel like I, i'm I, I would really like i i don't have an idea right now i'll think about it and i'd encourage everyone else to think about it and maybe we could work something out but it feels like right now we're talking in circles and i think i think we're all on the same page about all of the facts here, which is a, it's a cool newspaper. It's great that it's free. There's a lot of people who like it. And also the way that it's delivered right now is not allowed under our ordinances. Uh, and there's kind of a reason that ordinance was put in place. And so where we go from there, um, I don't really know, but it does kind of feel like we're talking in circles. No, I agree. I, you know, the point of having Mr. Smith here tonight was so that we could have this conversation um, with him as a, as a body, um, I agree that I don't think we need to go too far down the road on talking about the ordinance one way or the other. Um, I think he has a pretty good sense now of where we stand, um, and I think that was the point. Um, but, Councillor Zaret, if you want to have a closing comment, and then we'll wrap this up. You're muted. Which is probably everyone's wish. Um, <laughs> just quickly, I may have missed it, but did anyone answer about the option for, for kiosks uh, to be able to obtain these papers in, um, you know, publicly, like on the sidewalk or stuff? I may have missed that. Is that a question to Fran? We have key, uh, we have papers available on, so we, call, we call single copy. They're available like a big wide, there's a big, a big ease, there's a big stack, there's all over town, there's lots of papers available. That doesn't, that's a supplement to our home delivery. Uh, but the home delivery is where we, again, it's all about, it's all about food. <laughs> it's all about stop and shop and Big Y and, and uh, now River Valley Co-op and Big E's. Okay. Thank you, Fran. I appreciate you Thank coming you. tonight. I know we didn't, we didn't solve anything for you, but I did think it was important for the council to hear you and be able to ask you some questions. So thank you for coming. Thanks appreciate for allowing it. me to be here. Have a great sure. night, everybody. Thanks. I'll take a motion to close the public hearings. So moved. Second. Motion second to close the public hearings. Barbara. Uh, Omar Gomez. Aye. Uh, Tom Peake. Aye. Ann Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zarin. Yes. Peg Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. And the public hearings are now closed. Um, Next up is communication from elected officials, boards, and committees. Anyone? Councilor Zaret. Oh, before you start, um, I, I want to make the comment that to all the city councilors that we're going to go with a, th a hard three minute announcement stop this week. We are likely going to, I'm also going to probably, I'm thinking about moving that to a one minute as we move into the summer, just to keep the meetings a little bit shorter as we kind of get into the summer, because I know folks have a lot of things to do, but it's, you know, it's kind of, a, and just for everyone watching, that's at my discretion. So um, we're going to, we're going to do a hard stop after three minutes today. Councilor there. I will now start the clock. Oh, good. Uh, just quickly, we talked about this before. Citywide cleanup day is May 29th from 8 to 1 p.m., meeting at 50 Payson. Um, I apologize it's so late this year, but we needed time to organize with the prior organizer moving out of town. There's a sign up online. I can email it to you if you want, or go to the East Hampton Beautification page on Facebook. Um, I want to particularly thank my colleague, uh, Councillor Gomez, for offering the forum for residents to learn about the budget process. This is exactly the type of thing we can be doing to interact with the community more. Um, I appreciate Councillor Gomez for offering a public accessible and transparent event and spending um, your 6 p.m. on a Sunday uh, to do something like this. And maybe if you have time to offer another one before the budget hearings. Um, just wanted to um, talk about something else too. I got a bunch of messages this week uh, about something somewhat concerning and actually got another one during this meeting. Uh, so I want to speak to an issue in our community. Um, the internet and particularly social media can be a difficult environment to navigate. I watch day after day, the successful and unsuccessful discourse among friends and the general public on various groups and forums connected to our city. 
Social media is a double-edged sword, it offers great community options, but also can be a total cesspool. We're faced somewhat regularly with this often toxic, mean-spirited, needless aggressive, unprofessional discourse. Um, I told you about the messages I received, and to take the social media to defame, slander, and condescend residents and city employees and representatives is not within my conceived values of the city. Worse is when such statements are made by representatives who are tasked with promoting positive relationships throughout East Hampton's diverse population. Being appointed representatives of our city is a privilege, not a right. As an employer appointed member of the city, my opinion is there is a certain expected level of professionalism, kindness, and spirit of collaboration that comes with the positions. And let's be clear, when you make hateful comments like this, they reflect on you and really otherwise fall short. Um, but they also fall on the, they reflect on the city representatives um, making the comment, and they reflect on the mayor who appointed them and the city council who approved of this. And cumulatively, over time, when we see more and more comments like this from our representatives of the city, we just fall into this whole negative and toxic environment that brings us all down. And whereas we should be looking to elevate ourselves and, and put people in the city representative positions to elevate the discourse of the city. I have no tolerance for this. And I also hope that our mayor and fellow councilors have no tolerance for this type of toxic behavior from representatives of the city either. I condemn defamatory and hateful comments made by representatives of the city and any uh, resident of the city. And I look for options to make our city representatives a kinder and more collaborative collective. Three minutes. That was good. Anyone else uh, have any announcements tonight? Okay. Uh, any announcements from the president or the vice president? Dan, do you have any announcements? Okay, I do. <laughs> I'll go. Um, first, um, Barb, I don't know if this is the place for me to do it, but I want to spe set a special meeting for the city council for September, uh, September, for June 16th. Um, we typically in the summer only have one meeting, which is the first Wednesday of the month. We're going to set a second one for June 16th, six o'clock. Also, I hope they're still here, but maybe they're not still here. Um, they are. I want to, um, announce that we have, uh, Councilor Gomez and I have established a city council internship and we have, uh, the first two interns. Uh, now have joined us, Gwen Hiller and Madeline Moynihan. I don't know if you guys are here, if you want to put your camera on so we can see you. There's Gwen, there's Madeline. Uh, both Gwen and Madeline are seniors at East Hampton High School. They are both participants in the We the People uh, program. And so congratulations, you did a great job this year. Um, and so Councilor Gomez and I are working with both of Madeline and Gwyneth, their, their goals for this uh, internship really to understand and to become more involved in the workings of local and municipal government. So uh, we're, we're gonna be mentoring them through something as simple as the city council meeting. And then we're going to you know have them try to absorb the charter and city council will, so you may see them at some of the council, the committee meetings, which is great. Um, and if, you know, if you are open to helping them kind of navigate through some of those meetings that you guys have particularly ordinance, um, that would be great. There's not any tasks that we're asking them to do for the city council. This is really us mentoring them so that they can gain more knowledge around um, the inner workings of the government that they live in. And they both hope to when they go to college to kind of continue in the political science and the legal realm. So um, this is a, a perfect uh, entree into that and just add to the education that they already have. We will have Gwen for probably uh, close to a year because she's gonna take a gap year after graduation. And Madeline we have for about five or six months. So we're gonna load her up with all this knowledge before she goes off to college. So um, I just wanted to welcome them both, introduce them to the city council and to the public. Thank Councillor Gomez for uh, working to help stand this up and all those folks at East Hampton High School who helped us facilitate getting this 
this going. So welcome, Madeline and Gwen. Um, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to say anything, but do any counselors have anything they would like to say? Counselor Zaret. <clears throat> uh, just welcome this. Uh, and thank you, President Conniff and uh, Counselor Gomez. This is a great idea. And thank you to uh, those involved in making this happen. Uh, uh, Gwyneth and Madeline, um, obviously, I'd love to be here as a resource um, and um, contribute to your experience with the city council um, and answer any questions you have and uh, here to make this a, an educational, enjoyable experience. So welcome and enjoy. Councilor Risk? Yeah, first, thank you for coming. And I believe both of you participated. Just nod your heads and we the people. Congratulations. We've won that for many years and it's because of smart kids like you. And I want all the counselors to know that I'm intimidated because these two people are probably a lot more smarter, smarter than all of us. I had the pleasure of having two We The People uh, students on the Charter Review Committee. I think Councilor Peak and Councilor Gomez remember them. They were extremely valuable insights into the Charter Review. And I think you both will find this interesting. I encourage you, we have a finance committee meeting tomorrow and we have a budget <laughs> meeting next week. If you wanna learn about one of the biggest things we do, it is the money. It's one of the reasons I liked being on the finance committee all these years, because we spend $46 million and local government is all about how we use our tax money. So I encourage you, if you ever have any questions about how the budget works, Councilor Conniff, I, and Councilor Gomez, and any counselor can help you uh, and come to our meeting tomorrow night if you'd like, because you might, and if you have questions, uh, certainly we'll open the door. But thank you for, and congratulations on We the People, and thank you for doing this. So I, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but if you would like to say anything, Gwen or Madeline, you can certainly go off mute and say, if you don't want to, totally fine. Then you don't have to go off mute. I'm not gonna put you on the spot, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I know you're kind of in the throes of ending senior year. You've got a few tests going on. So thank you both for coming. And uh, we look forward to working with you over the next few months. So take care, guys. Thanks. You can stay if you'd like. No worries. Okay. Uh, anything else from that? All right. So we will turn it over to Mayor Communications, Mayor LaChapelle. Also, Mayor, I'm going to ask you if at some point you would meet with both of our new interns to kind of give them your perspective as well. So thank you, President Conniff. And I would uh, be more than happy to meet um, with both of the council's interns um, in their busy schedules, especially at this time of the year. Uh, I just wanted to share um, the city's next steps with uh, as it relates to Governor Baker's announcement yesterday uh, around uh, mask wearing and COVID-19 uh, protocols. And on the, the 29th, um, there's some major changes as far as mask wearing and social distancing. We have been asked in our investigating right now what happens to businesses, uh, private businesses that want to keep masks on. In particular, um, a lot of grocery stores are looking to do that for their staff um, and our Board of Health and Health Director is, is looking into that. We hope to have an announcement soon. Um, occupancy requirements on buildings are now totally lifted, um, including public buildings. So we will welcome back uh, city employees uh, into the public building um, right on um, at, at the soonest possible date, June 15th. Um, I plan after speaking with legal counsel um, to do the same uh, around opening city buildings to the public. At this point, uh, we are going to remain with July 1st. We still have some preparation to do um, to be ready for the public on, on July 1st, but we don't expect any occupancy uh, or, uh, limits. We will put out detailed um, information 
pertaining to the city and operations and also any businesses. There are some business businesses and industries that still have um, mask wearing guidance and we'll be spelling that out. So I appreciate everybody um, being patient we want to make sure that we can get um, this uh, correct uh, the first time around and out to everyone. And we'll be using our electronic billboards um, as well as sending out uh, press releases and putting things on official Facebook pages of, of what the next steps are, where masks are required and where they aren't, social distancing. Um, there are also um, the guidance around recreation and uh, camps in particular really changes and opens opportunity for those uh, recreation activities as well as camps to expand. Um, we planned and budgeted um, to have reduced capacity in our camps. And while we'll look at an increase in some way, it is very likely we will not be able to increase the capacity of our camps, um, but access to recreation, we're hoping to, to push out. And actually, Park and Rec is meeting tonight, I think at 5 o'clock, and they'll begin that conversation. Um, so there, there are a couple of activities and whatnot, uh, big concerts uh, that we said no to uh, until August 1st. And the question is, could they really plan at this point to do something during the summer? Do we have the capacity to allow it? So things, questions like these, always welcome to give a call to my office or email mayor at easthamptonma.gov with specific questions. Uh, but we'll be getting out uh, local guidance in the next couple of days. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor, um, so if if the potential is to open the buildings up to the public on seven one, which is undecided yet, I guess. Um, I'm trying to figure out if July seventh should be our first city council meeting in city council chambers with the public there. We can certainly do a meeting or two without the public in city council chambers, but I just. And maybe we need to talk offline to figure out those dates, but I'm just trying to figure out if we should plan for July 7th to be in full with the public in council chambers. I, I would say yes. I mean, July, I mean, other than the governor's guidance rolling back, we will be ready to welcome uh, the public and employees back into City Hall on July 1st just employees, 100% of our employees can be in the building at the same time on June 15th. Got it. Okay. So yeah, everything. And, and that would also apply to other committees, um, you know, who want to meet in um, City Hall. You go about that the exact same way. Um, I have signed uh, the order that you put forward um, around allowing in-person and remote participation. Um, and we will circulate that, excuse me, we will circulate that um, around uh, city communication points so folks know that they have an opportunity. And I, I hope um, that we'll see continued remote participation in the upper levels as well as in person. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. I know there's, there's new tele, there's new technology in city council chambers that we all have to kind of get accustomed to. But the intent, I think, of city council is to hold hybrid meetings kind of going forward, where we might be in, in council chambers, the public might be in council chambers, but the public could also be on screen. And we've got the technology to do that. We just all have to get smart and figure out how we're going to do that in a live meeting. But it exists. It's been installed. And so... We'll see how that goes. We have, we have a lot of training, more training than when we head for Zoom, so buckle up. Um, Councilor Rist. Just a comment, and thank you, Mayor, for that. I think we should wait until after July 7th to start scheduling in-person committee meetings. And I say that because we do have the, we, we've, as the mayor just indicated, we signed the uh, open meeting uh, variation, I'll call it, that allows some of us to participate remotely as long as a quorum exists in the in-person meeting. And I encourage that because the new normal is if you have the flu and if you're sick, 
and you really want to attend a meeting because there's a vote you want, you may not have to do that now. And I think that's something we need to think about going forward. And wearing a mask if we just have a cold isn't a bad idea either. In other words, there's a new normal. And I think we should all begin to be aware of that. Um, and I would just encourage the president and, and the council not to start scheduling in-person committee meetings until we get a handle on what that means in like room one uh, and in chambers because committees have to have two members there. So I think after July 7th, we should start scheduling committee meetings. And that's just my opinion. That's up to the president and uh, the mayor. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else, mayor? No. Thank you. Okay, moving on to reports of standing committees, finance council risk. Thank you, Thank Mayor. Thank you, Madam President. I have first a motion to request. We would like to change the fiscal reports for uh, the auditor and, and the uh, COVID grants to quarterly uh, reports. We find that to be more efficient than asking for monthly reports. So in a form of a motion, I would like to change those two agenda items to rather than monthly to quarterly reports. Second. Motion is second to change the naming uh, or the frequency of the two finance reports to quarterly. <laughs> Any further discussion? Barbara. Tom um, Peake. Aye. <coughs> Sorry, Dan Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zarrett. Yes. Ned Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Omar Gomez. Aye. Those, those are now changed to quarterly. Continuing on, we've had three budget hearings. Uh, they have been very informative. I really encourage the council, especially the members that haven't been at the meetings and the public to look at those videos. They are informative. We do go over them line by line. Not a lot of questions. The budget has been reduced 2.5%, almost 3% in total from last year, so it's a tight budget. We have our last meeting tomorrow night of budget review, which will be general government, which is a lot of different departments, auditing, uh, human resources, uh, planning, et cetera. These, these particular uh, departments tomorrow night, as well as the CPA budget. And then we're gonna look at our revenue estimates for next year, which is the entire budget is based on. So I encourage people to attend. If anybody has questions, as Councilor Gomez brought up at one of our meetings, please don't hesitate to call us or uh, email us. If you look at those uh, videos, for instance, and you have a question, I, I love them to come before the budget hearings, obviously. Uh, you, we certainly will entertain questions from councilors at that time. The budget hearings are June 2nd, um, and the uh, I believe the president setting June 16th as a meeting, that meeting will be special to only public hearings. And just to remind the counselors, if a change in the budget occurs, we would have to reassess the motions that require the budget to balance. So that's why that particular section say, if we decided to change that budget, we would uh, have to have that continued to June 2nd. Um, I personally hope that doesn't happen. Also, uh, on the 26th, the uh, Finance Committee will meet. That's next Wednesday. The Finance Committee will vote on each budget section um, at that time, as well as new business, which I would like to read into the record at this time. Um, I'm going to read as a first reading the following supplemental appropriations. A request is hereby made for approval of the following appropriations for workers' compensation, $19,701, to be transferred from free cash, $19,701, to be transferred to the workmen's comp account, $19,701, for the purpose of workmen's comp employee coverage, fourth quarter payment reminder, unanticipated expense, and FY21 budgeting. Uh, the next appropriation is hereby made. For the amount requested is $94,400 to be transferred from free cash, $94,400 to be transferred to the snow removal account, $94,400 to be 
for the following purpose. The funding will cover a shortfall in the DPW snow removal budget, FY201. And the last appropriation is requested of $63,000 to be transferred from cannabis stabilization account to be transferred to the fire full-time supervisory account, $30,000 and the vehicle repair and maintenance account, $33,000. The amount requested will be used for the following purpose, to fund the above requested line items for deputy fire chief position from July 1st, 2020 through July, December 26, 2020, and refund repairs to ladder one for the new hydraulic swivel hoses and all new wear pads for alignment. I shall make a motion to send these to a finance committee for review and also to set a public hearing for June 2nd on these items, as I believe they'll be short and not, and not delay our budget hearing. So June 2nd for public hearings. That's one motion. Second. Motion second to uh, move three appropriations to the Finance Committee and also to set public hearing for same on June 2nd. Any further discussion? Barbara. Um, hmm. Uh, Dan Rist. Yes. Lindsay Rothschild. Yes. Owen Zared. Yes. Meg Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Omar Gomez. Aye. And Tom Peak. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Madam President. That concludes. Okay. Uh, public safety, Councilor Gomez. Thank you, Madam President. We had a meeting a few weeks ago. And uh, we discussed the um, recommendation two and three from the major first group report. Uh, we have really good assistance from the public and uh, we have a really good input from the community. And we're gonna keep continuing the conversation with the public and the police department that I think is important to have everybody on the same table. And uh, next time we're gonna start discussing uh, recommendation four and five. Uh, we schedule a meeting for June June 1st at 7 p.m. And that concludes. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Gomez. Appointments, Councillor Rothschild. Hello. Um, so we have one mayoral appointment. So I, I move to move the following mayoral appointment to the Appointments Committee. Daniel Hartman to the the planning board with the term expiration 1231 2022. Second. Motion second to move the mayoral appointment to the appointment committee of Daniel Hartman Planning Board 1231 2022. Barbara. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Owen Zara. Yes. Meg Conniff. Aye. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Omar Gomez. Aye. Tom Peak. Aye. Dan Rist. Aye. Motion passes. Our next meeting will be Thursday, May 27th at 3.30. And thus concludes. Thank you. Ordinance, Councilor Derby. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Ordinance Committee met with the Planning Board for a joint public hearing uh, last uh, week. And um, so that, that thus the need for a second meeting in June. Um, we have all three items on our agenda currently. Um, we're able to get wrapped up with that joint public hearing. Uh, the, the planning board recommended all three of them uh, to us unanimously. Uh, and the ordinance committee recommended all three of them to the city council. Um, and so uh, in the form of a motion, I would like to set public hearings for the following three items um, to amend adult use cannabis establishments uh, to allow for cannabis delivery, to allow multifamily with affordable units by plan approval, and to replace section 8.5 to allow ADAs or accessory dwelling uh, units with a building uh, permit or special permit. Uh, and that is in the form of a motion. Second. second. Motion second to move these three particular items on the ordinance to a pub to a public hearing for June 16th. June 16th at 6:15. Okay. Any discussion, Barbara? Uh, Owen Zarab. Yes. Meg Conniff. Yes. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Omar Gomez. Aye. Tom Peak. Aye. Dan Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. Motion passes. I kind of wanted to enjoy having a clean slate 
for a week, but we do have new business. So if it pleases the, the president, I will move that uh, to ordinance. May, may I just ask a question of the last, uh, my hand was up, Madam President. Go for it. Uh, Councilor Derby, first of all, congratulations to you and your committee, uh, especially Mr. Peake on his uh, working on affordable housing. I find it encouraging that that moved very quickly, and it's because of the efficiency of your committee and the work you've done. Two questions. One is, I assume that all of these, I just don't want to see a roadblock, uh, that these ordinances have gone to the attorney for review. Have you gotten any of them back yet with any major changes required? I don't think we've gotten them back yet, and I would refer to the president. I, I haven't seen them back, but we did have we did send them. Yeah, I I don't think I don't think I sent you Salem. I I don't think I sent you anything that I've gotten back. I know we got questions back, but I think those are still with the attorney. I'll double check, and if I have anything, I'll send it to you. But I don't think we do either. Thank you. My request is also that the, in the next packet for the June second meeting that we get an unredlined copy of these ordinances with the actual language, assuming that by then you'll have the uh, uh, attorney's opinion back and you make the changes as necessary. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I know that we did have for a couple of these items, we did have um, PowerPoint presentations or, or presentations that went along with them. And I'm, I'm sure there's probably a way to link those in the agenda. So uh, maybe I can, you know, see if we can figure out a way to do that so people can take a look at those ahead of time. Okay. Um, Councilor Zarek. Uh, the, to answer uh, Councilor Risk's question, we did get opinion back on the cannabis delivery and uh, the changes that were made. The, he did, there weren't really any concerns and the changes that were made weren't really substantial or, or counter to uh, anything that the attorney had weighed in on. And, um, and then quickly to uh, Chairman um, Derby, the, uh, the cannabis item expires on June 5th. Do you want just to give 30 day extension? I suppose we could do that. I'd like it to make it to the public hearing. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that I guess that makes sense. <laughs> it might spontaneously explode if we don't. So, in the form of a motion, may I please have thirty days on on that particular item, which is uh, cannabis delivery, I believe. Second. Motion second to extend cannabis delivery agenda item by thirty days. Barbara. Um, Peg Conniff. Yes. Salem Derby. Aye. Erica Flood. Aye. Wilmar Gomez. Aye. Tom Peake? Aye. Dan Rist? Aye. Lindsay Rothschild? Aye. Owen Zarin? Yes. All right, motion pass. Okay, and um, if it pleases the president, I will move the new business. Please. Okay, uh, so I move to re uh, to move the request to amend city ordinances, chapter 12, article seven, stormwater management ordinance to the ordinance committee. Second. Motion second to move the stormwater thing to uh, to um the ordinance committee any discussion barbara salem derby aye erica flood aye omar gomez aye tom peak aye dan rist aye Lindsay rothschild aye owen zara yes and peg conniff and uh, the last uh, piece of information is we will be meeting on, uh, I believe it's the, uh, I have it in my calendar as the 24th, but I feel like it would probably be the 25th. Um, so let me just double check uh, that date, but we are meeting next week. So let me just check from, it is May 25th, 6 p.m. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. And that concludes. Thank you, Councillor Derby. Uh, nothing on property, correct, Councillor Zarek? Okay. Uh, rules and government relations, Councillor Peake? Uh, thank you, Madam President. We have not met since our last meeting, and uh, due to the fact that you and the other member of our committee are also working very hard on the budget, we probably won't meet before our next meeting either. Uh, so thus concludes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have some ad hoc committees. Um, I don't know if, Councilor Peake, you have anything for ranked choice voting? I do. Um, so we're meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. 
Uh, we have the uh, city solicitor's feedback uh, on our proposed ordinance. So uh, I feel like it's quite likely we'll finalize that tomorrow and then it'll be a matter of, uh, you know, in, in the busy next few months, uh, finding a time to schedule a public hearing for that ordinance. I would... If, 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 if the budget just sails through and we feel really good about it, I'd like to make a pitch for maybe putting it on that special meeting so that we have an ordinance on the books prior to the date that uh, candidates can pull papers. That just seems symbolically to be a good idea. But uh, either way, uh, we can look to actually have a public hearing on that uh, fairly soon at that point. Um, the committee will be transferring to talking about voter education uh, initiatives uh, up until the election, at which point I suspect we will dissolve. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Peake. Uh, nothing to report on senior tax work off that is more or less in the hands of the uh, Council on Aging Board of Directors. Uh, Ordinance Review Committee, Councilor Rothschild. Uh, we reviewed Chapter 11 in our last meeting about animal control. And uh, again, we had midnight great input from our city clerk, Barbara Lombard, and from Officer Cici. Um, we are going to be reviewing Chapter 12, the environmental ordinances, in our next meeting, which is on, you can tell me, I think it's the 7th. 7th, thank you. The 7th at 6.30. And um, I'm going to be reaching out to the fire department, DPW planning office, agricultural commission and conservation commission for input on this, on this chapter. Wonderful. And thus concludes. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it. We've done old business. We've done new business and everything in between. I will take a motion to adjourn. I'll move. I'll move. Second. I never get as much enthusiasm as when I ask for a motion for that. <laughs> um, uh, Barbara. Uh, Erica Flood. Aye. Omar Gomez. Aye. John Peake. Aye. Leanne Rist. Aye. Lindsay Rothschild. Aye. James Errett. Yes. Craig Conniff. Oh, sure. And Salem Derby. Aye. All right. Thanks, guys. See Good you night, in a everybody. couple of Bye. weeks. Bye-bye.